Welcome to our webinar about single cell differentiation. My name is Yvonne. I'm a product manager at Lexigen, and today it is my pleasure to lead you through this webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will host a Q&A session with Merit, our speaker. So please type any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Before we start, I'd like to briefly introduce the speaker, Merit Romeike, from Max Perutz Labs Vienna. Merit received her bachelor's and master's degrees of science from the University of Heidelberg before she transitioned to the University of Vienna. Merit is now a PhD candidate in the lab of Christa Bücker. She investigates how a single cell state transition is regulated and which effects an impaired transition can have. In her work, she uses a combination of CRISPR screening and single cell RNA-seq approaches. And now, with no further ado, I'll hand over to Merit for her presentation. Merit, the stage is yours. Thank you, everyone. And first of all, I also really have to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this work here and to be part of this test run for showing. So I'm absolutely fascinated by, yeah. Yeah, I'm absolutely fascinated by the establishment of multicellularity. So think about how many different and highly specialized cell types are making up one body. And all of this in the beginning is starting with one single cell. The single cell is the fertilized oocyte, and the single cell then starts dividing. And for a certain period of time, these cells still always are the same. So think about uh, identical twins. And after the modular stage, what you see here, then something interesting is happening. Then cells start to undergo changes, which we think about as cell phase transitions, where they leave the cell state they are in and then enter a next cell state. And by having sequential cell phase transitions like this, you eventually give rise to this really complex embryos and later on organisms. So the cell phase transition we are interested in is just a day and a half roughly in mice after this modular state. So at this point, we have the embryo here, this pre-implantation epiblast. And in this inner cell mass, you can see the cells, which later on will give rise to all different tissues in this embryo. This epiblast is changing while the embryo is implanting into the uterus. So already in this difference between implantation, so pre-implantation and post-implantation, we have a cell phase transition in there. Now, I think it's very straightforward to imagine that it's super complicated to study this in the in vivo situation. These embryos actively are trying to hide from us by burrowing into the uterine wall. So what we're doing is that we have an in vitro system to model this differentiation. So we do have mouse um, stem cells, which are in naive format or naive pluripotency conditions. And within our in vitro tissue culture model, we can then differentiate these cells to formative pluripotency. We do this by a specialized culture system. So we can keep these cells naive under two eye lift conditions using two inhibitor and lift leukemia inhibitor factor. And when we remove these factors and add some other goodies to our medium, within 48 hours, cells are committing to formative pluripotency. So we talk about these two different flavors of pluripotency, naive and primed because the core set of transcription factors is shared between those two cell states. So most famously, OCT4 and NANOC. And even though this core set of transcription factors is changed, we do see a vast transcriptional rearrangement of these cells with specific markers and transcription factors for the naive set and for the formative set of pluripotency. And we also use these markers to monitor this transition. One example which will come up again and again in this talk is VEX1. Rex1 is a gene which is highly expressed in the naive situation, but then gets downregulated in formative pluripotency. And what we can do is that we use Rex1 expression dynamics to couple this to fluorescent reporters. So with this, we have a fax readout for the cell state. So before differentiation, zero hours of differentiation, these naive cells have a high expression of GFP. And then if you go into differentiation, they lose GFP expression. So we can have a very straightforward way to read out the cell state of these shape cells. Now, my PhD is pretty much started with this observation. So we were looking at transcription levels on fixed cells. So each dot you see, or each blue thing you see here is a nuclei, and you perform single molecule RNA fish probing transcriptional levels per cell. 
And we did this in this experiment for two factors, the naive marker TVX3 and then the formative marker FGF5. So I think you can clearly appreciate that these cells before differentiation have a really high expression of the naive marker, but pretty much no expression of FGF5. And if we now go into differentiation, this picture looks different. So globally, it's clear that there is a downregulation of TBX3. But now let's look closely at some of these cells. For example, there's one cell here, which has a lot higher transcriptional level of this naive marker than, for example, the cell right here, sitting right next to it. And this even becomes clearer if you look at this formative marker, FGR5. So some cells are bright shining with FGR5 expression, but some cells just don't show this pattern yet. So even just, just looking at two genes, we already see that this really is not a homogeneous process. It's a 2D um, in vitro cell culture system. So supposedly a very simple system, but even there we start to see heterogeneity. So we then wanted to really understand this heterogeneity. And what the first thing we did is that we did a small scale experiment. And that time SmartSig2 was the go-to plate-based single cell method. So we differentiated cells and fax sorted different time points and then subjected them to single cell sequencing. If you're not familiar with these plots, these are dimension reduction plots. Every single dot you see is a cell. The position of the dot is based on the whole transcriptome, so really reading out this whole genome information. I'm coloring in this case according to the time points, so you see early cells clustering over here and the later time point 48 hours of differentiation over here. And in this case, the size of the dot is a representation of expression levels. So here again, the naive marker, and you do see the global downregulation of this marker. Similar, we can look at the same data now for the expression for a formative marker, again, FGL5. And as we would expect, we do see the upregulation. But the interesting things are now happening here in the middle at this intermediate cell stage. So even if you just look at these individual cells, you see some cells, for example, here, which would from the time point they're collected in differentiation, they should be in an earlier cell state, but they're actually clustering with the later ones. So even with this very limited data set, we already again see heterogeneity on a genome-wide level. And to have that more portable, um, we then perform pseudotime analysis. So pseudotime is looking for the distribution of cells or data point, and then aligning these cells according to a shared axis, which represents the spread of data. And similar, the beginning and the end situation is rather straightforward. So we do see early and late time points. But with this, we can now quantify how the spread of this intermediate cell is working in there. And of course, this is limited because we really wanted to see all intermediates. And with this, we don't have the continuum of the cell state. So we wanted to go up and really do a fine time course of this differentiation looking at very short intervals. And at the same time, we also needed more cells to frankly just have a good statistic to look at these intermediates. So we decided to use uh, now a droplet-based method, um, 10x genomics, which is rather easy to use out of the box. But at the same time, we needed to have a way to multiplex these cells, to have it as a feasible experiment, but to also to control for any confounding experimental effects in there. So for this, we use the published method, which is called multiseq, and which is a very clever way to multiplex droplet-based single cell data. So it works like this. You have these DNA-modified lipids. The lipid is here on this side, and the lipid can interact with membranes, for example, cell membranes, but also nuclei membranes. And with this, you add a little flag, a DNA barcode flag to your cell. And you can use this flag with different barcodes. So now really biochemically, you label your cells with different sample barcodes. In our case, that would be different time points. And then you can pool these cells and now analyze this pool on a 10 x genomic chip, having really your controls within one completely having unconfounded technical bias in there. Data looks something like this. So in this heat map, every column you see is a single cell. And I'm checking for the expression or rather the presence of these markers, these DNA barcode flags. And what is really clear is that for the most of the cells, you have a clear idea which time point they're coming from. There's a certain fraction of cells where we cannot infer this information. That could be that they're really just not labeled in, in the biochemical part or that you're not able to check the barcodes. 
but these cells, there's nothing wrong with them. We just don't know where they're coming from. So I will continue to show these cells as an internal control because we argue that there should be just a random distribution of all the five time points we have in the experiment. There's another level here, which is really cool. And this is the ability to detect duplets. So in this columns, I shouldn't really say single cells, but rather think of it as a cell barcode. So something is encapsulated in a droplet. But we see that these barcodes are now connected with um, conflicting barcode information, most likely because two cells are encapsulated in the same droplet. And this is super useful for us because we can use that as a quality control measurement. So normally you would check for quality control for duplets by taking the number of detected transcripts per droplet with the idea that if there are two cells, you just have a higher chance to detect more transcripts. And this is something also we see when we look at our um, duplets identified by multiseq. but there are also is a large fractions of cells which normally would not be flagged in this quality control measurements. So we really have a stringent way to identify these duplets, at least the heteroduplets, which have two different time point informations. This is very useful for us because as we're interested in intermediates, these fake intermediates would be a confounding effect and we could be looking at artifacts if we're not really controlling for this. But let's dive in into the data. So this is now again a dimension reduction plot, a new map at this time, and we see early cells and the late cells. And you might be with our surprise in the beginning because we do see this cloud, but actually we, this is why we sampled the cells as well. We really want to see all intermediate cell stages, so all possibilities in transcription state these cells can, can be in. And what is also really clear and what we know from our system is that we really have a one directional process with one start and one end point, so no branching points off. We look at one cell phase transition and one isolated one. Now again, looking at pseudo time, so taking this measurement of differentiation, as I mentioned before, we have these cells where we don't know what time they were collected at. And what was really reassuring for us was to see that these cells are sampling the continuous expression space. So we have an intrinsic control to see how cells are distributing. But if we now look at the single time points, again, you see in principle, there is this progression. So these cells are differentiating within the time point as we would expect them. But also here, if you now look into this intermediate time points, you see interesting heterogeneity showing up. So for example, some of these cells, so the X position in this plot is this position in pseudo time. And then I'm just showing the cells coming from one time point. So some of these cells collected at 12 hours in their pseudo time position are really more similar to earlier time points, so more similar to the six hours. By some cells, which were directly in the same parturing dish, really look closer to 24 hours already. So even with this wild type differentiation, we already see heterogeneity again in the system. So we, are, of course, are wondering now where this heterogeneity is coming from. And other people have done really cool studies on this. So for example, you can again here see expression of Rexron GFP as a readout for naive. And in this time point, they use this as a live imaging reporter. And you can see here that a cell has to undergo a division to then be able to downregulate GFP expression with the idea that cells have to undergo one mitosis to then commit to a change, first of all. So we were wondering if we see this in our data set. And for this, I performed a cell cycle classifier. So we used marker gene expression of the cells to then have an impression for which cell cycle phase they're coming from. But this is a complete and silico analysis. And if we just look at how this is distributed at the time point, we roughly see the expected fraction of the cells. Keep in mind that the number of cells we analyze per time point is purely technical because it just depends on us pooling the cells. But now more importantly, how does this look in pseudo time? So we argue that if cells have to undergo a cell cycle phase, we should see a shifting of the peaks of the cell cycle markers in pseudo time, especially if you look at one time point. And we don't see this at all in our data. So I think this whole heterogeneity where it's coming from, is it an effect of cell cycle? All of these are, cell cy are actively cycling or are there other effects? Are we really looking at transcriptional bursting and noises in there, which I amplified later on? This is still really an open field and we're still investigating this. 
But anyway, I want to slightly change gears now. So the system we're working with, this exit from naive pluripotency, has been widely used as a screening platform. So several groups have performed um, pooled CRISPR-Cas9 knockout screens, where they infected their cells with genome-wide libraries, and then you wouldn't go into a normal differentiation where cells normally would be able to exit the state and then go to the next cell state. But with the screening approaches, they didn't always check for cells which retained these naive factors, so which were impaired in exiting the cell state. And by a combination of the screens, five major signaling pathways have been identified, which are required to drive this differentiation. Now, what I think is super striking is that this differentiation is so robust that if you just knock out a single factor, so if you just hit one single of these pathways, cells will still differentiate. They are maybe impaired, but the only thing to genetically completely block this differentiation is if you hit three signaling pathways at the same time. Otherwise, this robustness in the system is so big that we still we see impairment, but we do see some kind of effect. So we were not really interested in this complete block of differentiation, but we really wanted to ask, so what happens if it's just more complicated? What happens if this differentiation is impaired? And for this, we now started to analyze two different mutants. One of them is RVPJ. This is an effect on the notch signaling pathway. But for the majority of the rest of the talk, I will focus on TCF7L1. So TCF7L1, under our naive conditions, is repressed by beta catenin And we are actually stabilizing beta catenin by one of the inhibitors we're using. So at this point, then TCF7L1 is repressed and cannot act on the naive pluripotency network. When we go into differentiation, we remove this repression. TCF7L1 can become active and itself then acts as a repressor, repressing the naive network and therefore enabling this integration of this naive network. So if I'm talking now about differentiation impaired, this is what I mean. So if we again use this fax reporter to monitor the exit by downregulation of Rex1 GFP, you see that here there's a shift in the control cells. But if we do the same assay now of cells which are lacking TCF7L1, we do not see the shift in the population. Most of the cells are stuck in an earlier cell state, so not going into differentiation. Of note, we do have some cells which are able to escape. So this is not a complete block, but it seems to be that there's some kind of mechanism to overcome this roadblock or impairment rather. So of course, what you do now, we wanted to know what does it mean now, do you know right? How can you match this? So we turn to what I would call the workhouse in our lab for bulk RNA sequencing, so the exogen's quantic three prime uh, kit, with the big advantage that we really can multiplex a lot of different samples and we have a very reasonable readout for cell state because we get a good feeling for what is expressed in the cells. So we did this for cells before differentiation, so zero hours of differentiation, and for an intermediate time point in here. And what you can see is that we have rather close clustering of control and TCF7L1 cells in the beginning. But at 16 hours of differentiation, there's already this huge spread of the cell lines. But now we have one problem. So we know that these cells are in a completely different cell state already. They show a completely different profile in the fax markers. So how can we now compare these control cells to the knockout cells? All the or a lot of the effects we will see will be because we look at indirect effects, we're comparing apples and oranges, we're comparing cells of completely different cell states. And now to find the direct effects which are arising because there is this impairment in the gene regulatory network because of the genetic knockout is super complicated. I think this becomes clearer if you actually look at differential gene expression. So this is differential gene expression between the knockout and the control at the 2i state, so the beginning. There is already some differential expression, but there is a really huge effect at 16 hours of differentiation. But again, this is a convoluted effect between this direct effects because we're manipulating something, but also because we're comparing completely different cell stages. So we were wondering, can we use our fax reporter to match these cell states? So what we did is we sorted out very narrow window 
of controls and the knockout cells, first of all, for zero hours. So we really match them to have a similar like Swan GFP expression profile. And more importantly, we then also did this for the control cells. So we do have the shoulder of control cells appearing. We think that some of the cells are able to overcome this differentiation. So we match cell states by this fax marker. And then with the idea, now we want to look at the direct effects which are arising because we manipulate the system. And this was the part we were super lucky because we were able to test this new Luther 3 prime single cell RNA sequencing kit. So what we've done is we really sorted out single cells by fax with this matched cell state, and then have spawned Luther on them. And really all of these cells work very well in the kit. Um, we have a good number of detected transcripts for cells, so complexity within the library without spending millions and millions of reads for these cells. So having these matched cell states, what are the differences now? So here you can see that there's now a very intermixed clustering of knockout and mutant cells for the zero hours. And we still see differences between um, knockout and control for the differentiated samples. But especially if you now look at differential gene expression, these differences are very smaller than what we saw before. If our idea that we really match cell states, so now we look at gene-specific regulation. And what was really reassuring for us is that we looked at KLF2. KLF2 is now known to be a direct target by the repression by TCF7L1. And we do see upregulation of KLF2 by comparing these matched cell states to each other. So I think as, as a feedback from my side, so the quality, if you want to look deep into single cell data for Luther is really nice to use this. Nevertheless, here we still have the problem that we are still comparing a fixed or somehow what fixed cell state based on one marker gene expression. And again, we wanted to really have this complete picture in a, in a better and unbiased way. So we performed similar to what we did before, also again, 10x genomics on this, pooling this time, not only time points, but also our control and the knockout cells. Um, to again have in unconfounded experiments where we can then directly compare the cells with each other. And first of all, to check if everything worked as we expected, I now take expression of Rex1 per cell for each time point. And what you can see is if we take this time point information just as a false clustering, we see down regulation of Rex1 in the control cells, what means that they're differentiating fine how they should be. But similar to the fax plots, we see that the tcf 7 l one mutants are not able to commit to the same level of downregulation. So we do have a phenotype in there. These cells are impaired in differentiation. But of course, this is not really taking advantage of the single cell data. So let's look into this. And for illustration purposes, I'm just focusing now on the beginning and of the end point of these cells. So again, we can really distinguish zero hour of differentiation from the late time point in here. But if we now look at the genotypes, it's becoming really less clear. So we do see that there's an increase of tcf 7 l one cells rather closer to the beginning point and that they're lacking in this later point. But you can already see that the differences are not that major. And this becomes even clearer if you now look at all time points at the same time. So this is the same data set. I'm just showing the different genotypes on there. And you can see that pretty much these cells are occupying a very similar transcriptional space. There could be differences in the distribution, but again, cells per time point is purely technical. So we have to be careful that we are not looking at these effects anymore. And I think the similarities are becoming clearer if we Again, take the same plot. I just, for illustration purposes, split it up according to the genotype. And if you now look at the time points, also these later cells of TCF7L1 are somehow differentiating. It's not that we have a complete abolishment of differentiation. And uh, to be honest, that gave us a headache for a while. So how we know that there's a phenotype, we know that we're looking at functional defects. How can we now find this in this kind of data set? So for this, we then, of course, look what other people have done to look at mutant cells. And there's a very cool study by the lab of Betty Gertkens and John Marioni, where they took cells which are lacking TAL1, one of the major factors for the formation of blood cells, 
And then there may chimeras, so mixed embryos of wild type cells and these Taiwan mutant cells. And because the Taiwan mutant cells are also expressing uh, D-tomato, you can then distinguish by faxing out which cells are mutant and which cells are wild type. And then they looked at what are the different properties of the cells. And the phenotype in this case is absolutely striking. So you can see that here, the cells which are lacking TAL1 are completely not present in any of the blood clusters. So of course, this is a huge phenotype and this is a huge impairment of differentiation. There's just no formation of blood whatsoever. But what we understand as impaired differentiation really is a different issue. So again, we know these are functional different cells. But our impairment now really comes down to problems in, in establishing the right cell state in the right timings so in a timely manner, but not a complete abolishment. And to find these really small differences, we then again turn to pseudotime analyzers. So I again found a pseudotime access on the data set, and this pseudotime algorithm was agnostic to the genotype differences. So we're really just asking, take all cells, align them in differentiation, and then only later on, I check which genotype they're coming from. And what you now see is really striking. So we do see that the tcf 7 one mutants are always lagging behind the control cells. And this is, fact is getting stronger and stronger over time. So with this, we now really build a shared differentiation axis of the cells. And then by taking the cross-section of this differentiation axis, we should now be able to have matched cell states and then compare specific in this matched cell states. And with the shared axis, we can now start asking different questions. So if we now look at gene expression, so again, each cell is matched on the position of pseudotime. Now we start losing the differences between Rex1 expression. So what we saw before is a shift in cell state, not a direct regulation of this marker gene. And of note, there are some cells, like what we also saw in the fact sorting before, which have this shoulder appearing. So some of the mutant cells are able to overcome this differentiation block. And if we now look specifically at gene expression, these cells which are overcoming this differentiation blocks are then also able to downregulate Rex1. So with this now, we can really look at these direct effects because we can correct for the indirect effects. So conceptually, we're thinking about it like this. If we are working with mutants, which are somehow differentiation impaired, we have to be able to match the cell states. One way is to do it, for example, by this fact sorting experiment, but we can also do this now by using single cell methods. And with this, we cannot only fix match cell states, but we can also match a whole differentiation trajectory. So we would fix the cell state and then align the whole differentiation according to the cell states. And we really need to align these cell states to now ask specifically, if we have an aligned cell state, what are now the differences between the gene regulatory networks in the dependence of the genotype now? So to illustrate this further, so again, we can correct for effects in the expression of marker genes. So for example, KL4 is a naive marker gene. By correcting for cell state, we don't see any differences in KL4 expression. Similar upregulation of a formative marker, no differences with corrected cell state. But what is very important, we're not just overcorrecting any differences between these two data sets. So again, if you look at the direct target, so KLF2 should be a repress normally by tcf 7 l one we see that this repression or this lack of repression rather is still present. So we really can now distinguish the direct effects from the indirect ones. And this is not just a weird artifact of one cell type, but we've performed the same style of analysis also for RBPJ1 mutants, RBPJ mutants, and what you see in the phenotype and the distribution of pseudotime, it looks very similar. Absolutely makes sense. That's why we selected the cells. They also show a differentiation impairment and a slower differentiation. So they're also occupying earlier stages in pseudotime. But if we now take gene expression of this, we can again correct effects in marker gene expression. But we specifically don't see this misregulation, which we see of the direct effect in KLF2. So this is something which we don't see now. So we can now distinguish these direct from the indirect effects and specifically ask for the direct effects independence of the genotype. 
And this also allows us now to take it away from gene expression per cell, but really to take it to gene expression for an abstract position pseudo time, so for a cell state. So we can now start matching, not just for marker genes, but really in a transcriptome way, match cell states and then ask for not just differential gene expression, but really differential regulation of these genes as a function of pseudo time. And with this, I'm already coming to an end. I hope I, so I convinced you that even though this seems to be a very simple, straightforward 2D differentiation system, we already see heterogeneity in the system. And every time we now look at mutants, which have some kind of problem in differentiation, so which are differentiation impaired, we will observe a change in cell states, which is the phenotype we're looking for. But at the same time, this change in cell stage will always convolute direct and indirect effects on the gene regulatory network level. And by using a combination of single cell methods now, we can correct for these differences in gene um, differences in cell state. And now ask specific the question of how is this difference arising and what are the effects underneath this? So with this, I can only thank the people involved in this work. First and foremost, my supervisor, Krista, and then also Celine Sin and Jörg Menche, who are now really digging into network biology and take these data sets to look at fine-tuned network exchanges across to the time. And thanks again for Lexogen for giving me the opportunity to talk here. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Merit, for this exciting talk. We will now switch uh, gears slightly, let Merit catch her breath a bit before we start with the Q&A session. You can still type any questions you may have in the Q&A box. And I would like to take the opportunity to go over uh, the two 3'C kits that we used in the study. There we go. First up is Quantic. Quantic is a three prime mRNA seq library prep kit for bulk RNA sequencing. It has been widely used in roughly 900 uh, publications around the world. Quantic enables cost efficient expression profiling even at ultra high scale. So you can multiplex over 36,000 samples in a single run. It also saves computational resources and offers straightforward data analysis. As QuantSeq generates reads from the three prime ends of the transcripts, it allows more samples to be multiplexed, as Merit has also pointed out. In contrast to conventional mRNA-seq, the fragments do not need to be assembled along the transcript body, which complicates data analysis and needs transcript quantification to be done. QuantSeq generates one fragment per transcript and thus enables straightforward data analysis by counting the fragments, which decreases the turnover time and saves computational resources. Quantic does also not require any RNA pre-processing, such as RNA depletion or mRNA selection. The Quantic library preparation workflow therefore only consists of five steps and is much faster than the conventional mRNA seq flow workflow, which takes at least seven hours. The streamlined workflows also saves consumables and plasticware. The second library prep kit that was used in Merit's study is Luther, which is a three prime seq library prep for single cells. Due to its novel chemistry, it is suitable for ultra low inputs or single cells and even challenging cell types such as neuronal cells. Luther uses a direct RNA amplification technology that is termed THOR. This amplifies the original mRNA from a single cell without the need to create a cDNA intermediate. And thereby, Luther's 3' mRNA seq yields this unprecedented 
sensitivity and reproducibility for individual cells that was also shown in Merritt's talk. How does Thor amplification work? Thor amplification introduces a T7 promoter by oligo TT priming at the three prime poly A tail of the endogenous mRNAs. In a series of reaction steps, the protruding poly A tail of the mRNA is then removed, and the T7 promoter sequence is physically fused to the three prime end of the original mRNA molecule. Then in vitro transcription generates antisense RNA copies, which are shown in light blue here. The original mRNA is repeatedly copied by multiple transcription events. The, major, the major novelty of this whole thing is that the original mRNA molecule is copied and that is used as a template. So there's no need to generate a cDNA intermediate, which is commonly used in um, single cell methods. And therefore also, if you miss a molecule in the first round of amplification with Luther, you have the chance to catch it in subsequent rounds even. And this leads to the unprecedented sensitivity. With this, I would like to thank you for listening, and I'll end my short presentation with, a, with an additional announcement. We have recently launched our new RNA expertise hub as an e-learning resource. The hub contains short technology videos, also including Luther and QuantSeq, useful checklists for wet lab work, and our RNA lexicon. RNA lexicon is a collection of chapters dealing with sequencing, experimental planning, and the individual steps of an RNA-seq workflow. You can access it by scanning the QR code or by following the link below. And with this, uh, we will start our Q&A session with Merit. First, um, we would like to start with the pre-submitted questions. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions by typing to the Q&A box. So Merit, the first question is, how sensitive is the analysis and what are the smallest detectable differences? Yeah, I think the issue here is mostly that we can detect differences, but in the end, we always have to go to validation. So it is incredibly sensitive in, in the sense of, yes, there can be just finding it the other way around just finding a difference doesn't mean that it's a functional difference so this is something we always have to go back to tissue culture and look at but we do see really that on the expression of, of microgene level that we can have really fine time course in there and what we're currently doing is that we really look at single cells again with single molecule fish to then have an alternative approach to this thanks Baron, for this the second question is, why were different methods used for single cell RNA-seq? And what are the differences? And how did the combination of these methods help in this project? I mean, there are a couple of really practical um, things to consider. So we started out with the plate-based methods because there you can really go deep and find more information. That's also why our matching of cell states for Luther really was useful to get as much out as possible. So plate-based is super cool, but there are limitations in how many cells you can analyze, especially if you are not sitting on a limit, unlimited amount of money. So for example, so the droplet-based methods, we all of a sudden now have 24,000 cells instead of, yeah, that's a lot of plates, just to say it like this. But for droplets, it's really easier to scale it up with the downside of that we do not get as much information per cell. And so we were really wondering in the beginning if the small transition we're looking at, if we could resolve that in a droplet-based approach. That's why we started with plate-based, where we can really then go deep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. The next question is, there's already a difference between the control and the mutant in the beginning of your experiment. Where did this come from? 
Yeah, this is also something we're looking at right now. So it could be that we do see um, clonal effects in these cell lines. So one way would be to have a decontact, which we're cloning right now at this point. But it's also hard to say what these differences actually are, because I also looked at expression of the naive genes, because we were wondering, are they more naive, whatever that means, because it makes sense if they're missing the repressor that they have a hyperactive network. But this is not something we see in there. So this is, again, something where we would need to dig deeper, maybe with a different approach again. Mm -hmm. The next question is, how do you explain the cells that overcome the block and the differentiation? Yeah, I think this comes down to this robustness. So we do not have a master regulator, like for example, the Taiwan, which is a really striking example, which then completely abolished this differentiation. But we really have an interconnected network and there can be, or there's a lot of feedback between these nodes of the networks. So I really think of this impairment as it's somehow more complicated to establish the networks, but eventually for whatever mechanisms, there is this establishing and thoughts are then moving over. But for this, we really want to now look into the networks and see that we do find these small differences in there. So the mutant you showed, the knockout mutant you showed is lagging behind in differentiation. What are the effects of the time delay on the cells, or can they overcome this and develop normally later? Um, yes, so later is always a different issue. So this also is one thing in, in vivo. This is a slightly different regulation, and you have to say. But yes, in principle, they, they can overcome it, and they can leave the cell state. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans to move your analysis in vivo and how could that be done? I think because of the how, of course it would be super interesting to look at this in vivo. It's also very challenging. So just isolating this embryos at these early stages is, is a system which is not easy to do. I think what is a cool approach would be a bridging approach, which then still is in vitro tissue culture. But you can start doing 3D tissue culture where the embryoid bodies are even closer to the in vivo situation. But of course, all of this adds more complexity to the system. So in thinking in the terms of heterogeneity, I'm not sure if this is what we actually want to do, because it's nice to have such a straightforward, seemingly very easy system, because then we can really pinpoint the causes of heterogeneity in there. Are any of the mutants lethal? Yes, so there are some. Um, those are not the ones we want to analyze. So, but this is something we do see in screening approaches that some cells are just dropping out because they are dying. Also that they just start dying when we start this differentiation. But of course, then studying the effect of apoptosis is a completely different question. But yes, you can die in this process. <laughs> That is great. I think the last question we have is you mentioned that you found these mutations by CRISPR screening. Can you elaborate on that? So yeah, to be honest, that was not us, but other people have found them by screening. So there were a couple of screens performed in a similar approach. So taking so you take your embryonic stem cells under naive conditions, infect them in a pooled approach where you then have guides against all genes in, in the genome or targeted approaches when you're just interested in certain amount of factors. And then you trigger differentiation, but at the same time, you check for which cells are not differentiating now. So for example, which cells are still retaining this high expression of Rex1 GFP and also which cells are just surviving longer. Because if we do this, trans this transition, it is a dead end, dead end transition, at least under these culture conditions. So we would have to, again, exchange the culture conditions to then go into the next cell state. So normal wild type differentiation would be dead after four days. And looking at these mutants, some of them are surviving way longer because they pretty much, they don't see that they should not be naive anymore, but they just continue to be naive. And those are the strong hits of the screens. Mm 
yeah, I think we're at the end of our presentation of our Q&A session. Thank you again, Merit, for giving this exciting presentation, for answering all the questions. And with this, we will finish our webinar. Have an exciting rest of the RNA Society meeting, and we'll hope to host you soon with our next webinar.